webinar on the Paycheck Protection Program and Loan Forgiveness. Uh, we appreciate everyone joining us today. The program is intended to go about an hour. Um, we wanna make sure that we have time to answer everyone's questions, but we may not get to all of them given the time constraints. <clears throat> Let it be known, we, will, we, we have your questions that were submitted ahead of time. We are gonna be doing our best to track the questions during the webinar, um, but we, uh, we can always follow up and we are here at your disposal, especially those at the National Restaurant Association team. Uh, we are automatically muting everyone who's on the webinar, so we cannot hear you, but you can submit your questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the webinar will be recorded. We will be distributing it afterwards, likely within the week. Uh, so hopefully you'll have this well before Memorial Day, uh, because we all know that we want to do this kind of stuff Memorial Day weekend leading into the summer. So with that being said, uh, we want to jump right into the slide today. Uh, we have a great we have a great guest in uh, in Bill Briggs, a, a former SBA top official uh, who ran probably the biggest small business rescue plan, uh, short of the Marshall Plan uh, that that went over to Europe after World War II. Uh, but this is our first pandemic of the century, and small businesses. Uh, in the restaurant industry had a closure rate of around 90,000 over the past year. The only reason that number isn't higher is because of restaurants with a grit and gumption to stay open like the folks who are on the call, uh, state restaurant association partners who work tirelessly to help out, and public servants like Bill Briggs at SBA, his, uh, his colleagues and folks there, because um, they saw this coming in a way that we didn't because I think they started to build a bigger life raft as we knew how long this is going to go. Um, but Bill Briggs, now of BB Advisory, joining all of you in the in the private sector, uh, is joining us today. We want to give a little bit of a prologue of PPP. We want to talk a little bit more about forgivable expenses and terms. We want to apply. We want to talk about applying for PPP loan forgiveness, and then we want to jump into your questions. So, just quickly jumping in, what was PPP? Originally uh, designed by the CARES Act that passed in March of 2020, it was a small business temporary bridge loan. Essentially, how do we do an eight week loan to ensure that payrolls are maintained, that rent payments are met uh, over this really crazy 10 week, 12 week period of COVID-19. Uh, that's what the idea was when Congress passed it March, 2020. Since then, we know that the pandemic has gone on to, to, until today and probably longer, but $83 billion, $83 billion has been received by, P, by the restaurant and hotel sector. We are a top four sector that has received PPP. We're the number one under the second draw of PPP that was signed into law in December of 2020 and started in January of 2021. Uh, the average restaurant loan in 2020 was $111,000. If you're thinking about payroll, that's generally your average restaurant, which is about $1 million in revenue uh, per year. Obviously that number changed for 2020, but again, this was a temporary loan uh, that has become much more important and equally as important as the forgiveness process that we're talking more about today. So we talked a little bit already about the process of how the CARES Act uh, was designed. A really important thing that we are still talking about today is how when PPP opened in April 2020, it was designed for a short term issue. And by May and June, we realized that restaurants had to spend this in a different way. It couldn't go 75-25 to payroll versus rent and utilities. We had to have flexibility. We needed more time to spend the money as we were shedding staff and getting closure orders and capacity restrictions. So in June, the PPP Flexibility Act became law. And one of the most important things came to fruition in the safe harbor for FTE rehiring. That's called Safe Harbor One for FTE rehiring. And it meant if you are unable to return to normal business operations, you do not have to have the same FTE count 
when you are using them at the end of your PPP loan period as you had at the beginning of the loan period. So if you had 10 employees at the beginning, 10 full-time equivalent employees at the beginning of your PPP loan back in March of 2020 or April of 2020, but by the end of the loan, you only had five FTEs, you wouldn't automatically receive a reduction in your loan forgiveness amount. That was critically important. Uh, by December, 2020, there was a second draw of PPP and a streamlined forgiveness process for any PPP borrower of $150,000 and less. Again, a streamlined forgiveness process, that's two pages, you fill it out, you attest that you spent all the money correctly under eligible expenses, and you should be able to submit that to your bank to get that PPP loan off your books. And the reason why we wanted to have a loan forgiveness webinar uh, with an expert like Bill Briggs is we're reaching that forgiveness window time. If you took the 24 week window for your first draw PPP loan, and this is just an example here, but if you received your, your original PPP loan in mid-April and you opted for your 24-week covered period, it probably ended by, mid, by late September. And you have about a 10-month application window to apply for loan forgiveness and get it off your books by working with your lender. So as you can see, it's coming up pretty quick that that 10-month window would stop. Now, Bill offered a really important a point when we were talking earlier, he says, it doesn't mean that you can't apply for loan forgiveness after this 10 month window. But what it means is that you're gonna start having payments due as a, as a loan would, it would start uh, requiring payments to be due after that 10 month window. So let's avoid that. Let's keep the liquidity right there in the restaurant. Let's prepare to apply for full loan forgiveness. So with that, I, I'm, I'm very honored to hand it over to Bill Briggs, who's done so much for restaurants and small businesses across the country. Uh, Bill, take it away. Great. Thanks, Aaron. And, and you have the deck, correct? I just want to make sure I'm yes. we're doing the one, two. Can you see it? I cannot, but that doesn't mean anything. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me, uh, uh, anyway. Uh, first of all, it's just an honor to be here today. I want to thank everybody for joining. Um, there's a tremendous demand uh, for this information. Uh, and so just a, a quick kind of come from our background about myself um, and how uh, I got to ultimately be speaking to here, here today. Um, I have over 20 years of experience in Washington, D.C. and at the, both actually at the state level too, uh, working on public policy issues, particularly financial services. And in 2017, I was appointed by the president to uh, the Small Business Administration and the Loan Program Office and worked there for approximately two and a half years. And then um, in March of last year, our world dramatically changed when Congress decided to create the Paycheck Protection Program um, and you know, therefore uh, give SBA hundreds of billions of dollars as opposed to the $25 billion or so it had been doing every year. Uh, also, uh, you know, at that point, I was the, the number two in the program. The number one was also the chief of staff of the agency. So we were kind of all du dual hatting. But I was at the nexus of policy operations and communications for the program. And one of the key things that I was supposed to do, in addition to a lot of uh, tasks, was to make sure that the public understood the program, how it worked, and also uh, work with key external stakeholders like the National Restaurant Association. And let me tell you, I had the opportunity over the last 15 months to work with Aaron, with Sean, and other members of the NRA, and I could not be more impressed. You have a very strong, effective uh, advocacy organization uh, who are really trying to keep restaurants' best interest uh, at heart. And so it was my honor to be invited to speak to you today about this crucial phase of the pro program. And as Aaron said, when you look back and we created this program, the idea was to create a forgivable loan so that we could that 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 organizations or restaurants would not have to lay off all of their employees and that we would prevent mass unemployment. And if you recall, in March of 2020, uh, the national unemployment rate, if you can believe, was 4.8 percent. And by the end of April 2020, it had gone to 14.8 percent. And economists were saying it could go above 20 percent which would be considered a great, uh, another Great Depression level type event. 
Um, it's hard to remember some of the, the, the um, panic back then, but I'm sure many of you have dealt with that and, and do remember that very well. And what that program did is saying, we're gonna help you preserve your employees for eight weeks and then, um, you know, and then these loans will be forgiven and essentially act as a grant. And what has happened over the last 15 months is both Congress and SBA and, and the both administrations have adjusted the program to ultimately make it more easy and relevant for borrowers. So one of the key things I wanna to do today is to reassure you about this process overall, uh, because I know the real promise of the program and what many of you are interested in is having these loans off your books and not feeling like you have debt potentially on the books um, and you wanna make sure you're doing it in the right way. And so first of all, I, I, again, I, I think the, the, the intent is to clearly have most of these loans be forgiven. That doesn't mean it might not take a while and there should be some hiccups along the way, but that is clearly in the intent that both uh, the previous SBA administrator and the current one have um, said. And so I would, I would keep focusing on that. And again, as I said, over time, the program has evolved. So it went from an eight week or a 24 week covered period to now borrowers could choose any covered period to um, streamline forgiveness for up to 150,000, which again should cover the vast majority of restaurant industry loans. Um, and that is all with the recognition that um, this pandemic uh, you know, happened through no fault of anybody um, and that um, you know, they shouldn't be bur unduly burdened with trying to keep their employees on and do the right thing. And so that process has evolved. The key thing to remember too is it may continue to evolve. Um, I don't have a crystal ball, but my sense is, is it could happen. And that again, I think the intent will be to make it easier, more transparent and more accessible for the borrowers and the lenders with this program. Uh, the program as of the end of this month will end, meaning loans will no longer be allowed to be made, either first or second draw loans. Uh, there'll be a month of kind of what we're calling cleanup, where lenders will be able to clean up their portfolios and move forward. And then we're going to enter what I call the summer of forgiveness, which is lenders will shift if they have not already the majority of their operations to having these loans forgiven. Real quick, if you look at the current data and SBA posts data every week on forgiveness in uh, 2020, over 5.2 million first draw loans were made. These are the first time loans made in 2020 and nearly 3.7 million of them have already been forgiven. Um, 1.7 million uh, applications have not applied yet. However, that does not mean that they will not um, be ultimately processed. And then obviously we are now in excess for the total program of 11 million loans. So 6 million more either first or second draw loans have been made since the beginning of this, uh, the program was launched in January this year. Hey, Bill, can I, can, can I just interrupt you and underscore that point? How many loans are considered to be outstanding so far between the, the amount of loans that went out for first draw in 2020 and how many have not sought forgiveness yet? About 145,000. Okay, out mm -hmm. of how many? Out of uh, 3.7 uh, million. That's a fairly small number, Correct. all things considered. Right, and so that is consistent with the intent that most of these loans we will be forgiven in time, and that um, that should offer reinsurance even if the process seems somewhat confusing. I do also want to know that uh, you know we're going to get a little bit into this. Um, I also have received all of the questions, and so in my remarks, I'm going to touch upon them uh, moving forward. But the most important thing is. Um, I'm sorry, the, the, the second, in terms of forgiveness now, either on your first or second draw loans, you will work through your lender. Just as you went to your lender to apply for forgiveness, you will work with your lender to apply for forgiveness uh, during this process for both your second and if you have a first and second draw loans. If you have separate lenders, if you went to a different lender for your second draw loan, uh, you will work with that lender for that loan forgiveness process and you will work with your first draw loan lender in that, in that order. But the essentially what the program has done is deputize lenders to be the forgiveness agent to to not only help make these loans, but then essentially we've hired them to the federal government hired them um, to help process all of these loans, both in making them and then and getting them forgiven. 
And so you will continually, you don't go directly to SBA, you work with your lenders. Um, and so I, that seems pretty obvious, but sometimes you, you, you don't make the, 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 the obvious statements and people forget that. And the general timeline, and again, this is, this is, there's an asterisk on this timeline is, if you submit a full and complete application to your lender, the lender has 60 days to make a, re, a determination of forgiveness. And it has one of four uh, determinations that can make, and it could be approved in full, meaning the entire loan will be forgiven. It can be approved in part. It can be denied, meaning all of the loan will not be forgiven, and it, or it can be denied without prejudice. And again, it won't be forgiven, um, but the lender has made a, a it's, it's, has no determination of why. Um, and those are very rare cases, to be frank. It, the most common one, quite frankly, is either approved in full and then uh, to a lesser extent uh, approved in part. And I think the data, last I checked, showed over 98% of all loans are fully forgiven. So it, it's a pretty strong amount, if not 99% of the dollar value of those loans. Um, so that the lender then has 60 days to take your information, make a determination, submit it to SBA. SBA then has 90 days. Um, that is the standard they are going for. In some certain circumstances, I, I've seen from the comments um, that has exceeded 90 days and gone way past that. That is okay. Um, it doesn't mean your loan's in trouble. It just means SBA is a little busy, busy right now. The other thing too is if you take those two time frames, so 60 and 90 days, that's almost half a year for, for the forgiveness process. So one of the things, again, I wanna encourage you is to, to one, have hope that most of these loans will be forgiven, but two, to understand the timelines that both lenders and SBA are operating on that essentially almost gives them up to a half a year for that to be forgiven. Now, the majority of these won't take that long, but it could, and in some circumstances, could exceed that. And I think what is happening, particularly as the loan-making portion has ended, is that SBA will ramp up their review and forgiveness process. The final thing I want to note at the bottom, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this during my presentation, is that SBA has the right to look at any loan or loan file, and as part of their review process, as, as part of ensuring that they have adequate controls and that they are there are guardrails to prevent to protect taxpayers as part of this because as business people you also have an interest as taxpayers in ensuring the program has integrity that they will have the right to any look at any loan application or forgiveness application or so forth what that essentially means is they can call up a lender and request the applicate the original loan application they can request the loan forgiveness document and they can request the supporting documentation which may include tax, uh, pay, uh, tax uh, documents, uh, uh, bank statements, uh, utility statements, and what have you as part of their review process. Now part of that too is, is that there might be some, you might have a $25,000 loan, which again, with your certain safe harbors, you wouldn't expect a level of scrutiny. However, SBA might have the, every now and then, just check on a $25,000 loan for no reason. It doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. So again, as part of my message to reassure you today is that most of these will be forgiven. Have some patience because there is allowance for both the lender and, and SBA to do that. And that also too, if there's a check or there's a request for more information, it doesn't mean ultimately your loan will not be forgiven. It could be part of a, a, a process that SBA has to make sure there's program integrity. Um, and, and, and Bill, if I, could just, <clears throat> if I could just double underline what you said there, the program integrity is really important. And just because you applied for forgiveness, as Bill outlined, most people have applied for forgiveness. <clears throat> Let's say best case scenario, the bank comes back and says, yes, green light, the loan is off your books, SBA is buying it off, and your loan is forgiven. Keep all of your documentation. Right. We, you've worked too hard to get to this point to just put that in the trash and say, clean my hands, I'm all done with it. Retain your records. For example, there are other restaurants we've heard that said, I plan on taking the employee retention tax credit for parts of 2021 as well, as is your right to take ERTC uh, for a variety of different reasons if you, if you meet that criteria. You need to know exactly when you met payroll with PPP for first draw and second draw so that you don't intersect those funds with your ERTC. 
and your accountant might have a great idea in 2022 to go back and claim ERTC for a calendar quarter in 2021. But you need to make absolutely sure that you're not intersecting those funds uh, on PPP payroll costs and other things. So it's really important to document everything that you've done with PPP and even more so to maintain it for future eligibility and future compliance. Great, so why don't we uh, just jump to the, the next uh, slide real quick. And this is again, the top level overview. We're gonna get into more details in, in a few minutes. But again, one the whole purpose of this program, if you go back to March, was to help small businesses pay their employees. And so the standard was originally 75% of, so at 75, if you got a $100,000 loan, as an example, $75,000 of that had to be used to pay for payroll expenses. And you can see the acceptable payroll expenses there. Um, and again, there, there's, there's a little bit more than that too, but um, that was the idea. Then Congress passed the PPP Flex Act, which changed the world down to 60%. So again, that's an example of how Congress and the administration have made it easier for borrowers because uh, particularly restaurants, their only expense is not payroll, there are other expenses too that are, are not included. However, you do have to spend at least 60% of the loan amount for payroll expenses as defined by the program in order to receive full forgiveness. And let's be very clear what forgiveness means. Many people have this mistake, and I'm sure we've all heard these stories of some guy in Florida who took out a million dollar PPP loan and bought a Lamborghini. We've all heard it, I've heard of it. First of all, that guy's going to jail for a long time, so don't cheat on this program. There's consequences. But two, that um, you know, the, the, the program is um, uh, 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 meant to really cover payroll costs and, and, and so forth. And so that's an important part of your, your documentation process as well. And what that means is, I'm sorry, in that, in that Lamborghini example, people thought SBA gave that money out to that guy who bought that Lamborghini. And actually what happened is the lender put their money up first. So if you received a PPP loan, that money actually came from the lender. And if it's not forgiven yet, the government and the taxpayer have not put out that money yet. That's really important. So once your loan is fully forgiven, what happens then is SBA transmits the balance of the loan and interest payments to the lender to reimburse them for upfronting that money. And that's something that people sometimes forget. They think the government has already put out money. The way the government is protecting itself is it's allowing itself to review these loans during the forgiveness process, and that helps protect the taxpayer. Again, um, any Aaron, any questions, comments on that one real quick? You're muted. <laughs> yeah, I'll jump in with a question as long as we have a window there. Um, and I, I'm not exactly sure what's here, but can triple net rent rent obligations be a part of PPP qualified expenses? I.e., I have to pay as part of my rent contract all property taxes and property insurance. Uh, the the property taxes I'm not sure about. The rent, uh, you know, the, the basic rent would be, and then um, I believe that could be covered operations um, expenditures. Um, the property insurance. It could be, it depends. Um, if it's relating to payroll expenses, human resources, uh, accounting, it, it depends a little bit. Um, that might be questionable. The property taxes, I'm not aware of um, that it can be used for. Okay, great. And one, one more real quick. If, if an entity went into bankruptcy after receiving PPP, um, is the covered period extended to account for the bankruptcy period? Or how is that? I would assume if it's PPP one and you are able to meet all your obligations in the covered period and then went into bankruptcy, you can still apply for forgiveness. But is it different if you went bankruptcy if, if you came out of and what i'm saying is right. if you came out of bankruptcy how does your covered period get affected if at all come out I, I, so let's just be clear because again i i like to keep it very um 
the covered period is the term either eight eight to twenty four weeks that you're saying I'm going to use the loan money for the cup for the appropriate purposes both payroll and non payroll and so when you're thinking of forgiveness what you really have to track is what you did in that covered period and what you did so Aaron to your question during the covered period as an example the person went into bankruptcy and then came out right so they're asking that if their bankruptcy proceedings offered a, a pause button on their covered period and then they could unpause the covered period after they emerged from bankruptcy proceedings i'm guessing it's no i'm guessing that is a loan they, they are now taking a loan or there's unforgiven portions of that ppp loan right. because ppp said spend it in this covered period or else it's just a loan period well, and also too on their application, they certified to not being bankrupt when they applied. Right, so, and then, yeah, exactly. They went into bankruptcy after receiving PPP. It sounds like they went into bankruptcy during the covered period. Uh -huh. so what, what I think what I'm trying to say, not to you, Bill, but to the to right. the restaurant is, there's not a pause button on your covered period. The covered period is going to be a duration that you need to spend your PPP funds. If you entered bankruptcy and you weren't able to do that, then that PPP loan is still a loan. It does not get fully eligible for forgiveness. You could probably still get forgiveness for the part, the portion that was spent for eligible expenses during that covered period, but it, there's not a pause button, unfortunately, on the covered period. No, it's, it's up, the, the max is 24 weeks. So the day that those funds are deposited into your account, that starts the clock and you have up to 24 weeks. So if the bankruptcy happens in those 24 weeks, and then you come out of that, uh, you, like you said, that it'll probably be a situation of partial forgiveness. So I, again, I just want to jump back. And, and again, th this was just um, some of the, the payroll expenses. You're all probably, if you applied for this, you either had your accountant or you did it yourself. Um, you know, the what was an acceptable payroll cost that counts towards that 60%. But then also, too, I would note the acceptable non-payroll costs. And Aaron, Aaron knows this well. Um, again, this is one of those examples over time how uh, Congress and the administrations have expanded and responded to input, particularly from organizations like NRA, um, to say, "Okay, wait a minute. You know, this doesn't make sense. If we can't if we can't spend some of the funds on worker protection measures or supplier costs, or um, you know, our group life premiums or what have you." Um, it, the program doesn't work for us. So what they again have done is it said of that 40% of the fund amount, you can potentially spend it on some of these things, including operations, including supplier costs and all of that. Um, so, I mean, those, 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 the, one of the standards for particularly supplier costs is it's essential to the business that time. I know that particularly in the restaurant industry that might include food or groceries as part of that, um, that would generally probably be considered a supplier cost. Um, and that because they're perishable goods as well. And so that's something too that to consider as, as part of that. Um, there's also damages. And, and unfortunately, as we saw last summer, there were situations where um, there were riots or disturbances in, in cities. Um, and so if you, you know, the cost of repairing your restaurant or so forth uh, may be covered as, as well of that um, as a result of these public uh, disturbances. And then finally, too, if you've had to install sneeze guards or we have all seen them in restaurants. Uh, you go around and you've had to essentially make your, uh, reorganize your, your restaurants to make them uh, safe to have some level of activity, certainly not full level. Um, those, those expenses can be covered under the non-payroll side. The bottom line is, and I, the, as long as you have used the majority of your loan as defined by 60% for payroll, as defined what you see there, you are good. The one key thing I would remind people is this does not include your federal taxes. So a, a state and local tax is different from a federal tax. Do not put your federal taxes into your forgiveness amount. That's something I see often and it should not happen. And it's state and local taxes in that regard. Aaron, I don't know if you have any uh, additional comments on that. No, I, I think that covers that point really well. Um, yeah, th th I think we can move on. Okay, great. Um, and, and so I don't, I see some questions. If, are there any, do we want to take a quick question on that too? Um, is there anything else? Sure. Uh, 
one of the questions we see is from a couple of people now is the, 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 the second draw process for PPP, if you received a loan in January and that was you, you used the eight week window and it closed in March, or if you, if you chose the 24 week window, but you used all your PPP already, Hypothetically, you could go to your bank and say, I'm ready to apply for PPP second draw forgiveness, right? You have the forms that are available to you. Your bank should be able to process a, a, a PPP loan forgiveness form, whether or not it's first draw or second draw right now, right? Right. I want to be very clear on this though. Right now, I think there's less than 3 billion of funds and it is, it is very hard for most lenders who aren't community financial institutions to actually access SBA systems to put the loan in for processing. So I don't want to get people's hopes up, Let, but let's take a, a different example. The program opened January 11th originally for CF, CFI lenders. Let's say you got a loan February 1st. Uh, you, you chose an eight week program, first draw loan. Uh, you have eight weeks, essentially after the, the, the eight weeks, and I'm using a shortened example here, but you know, come May 1st, you could, after spending the funds, apply for a second draw loan. There was no prohibition from getting a first and second draw loan in 2021. You just had to wait for the eight week period. The idea of the program is that you're helping to cover expenses for an eight week period. So I would not encourage, if you had done that, I would not encourage you to, to make sure that there's appropriate space or eight, eight week period between the first and second draw loan. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and and um, if you received a second draw loan, and you're done with the covered period or you're done with the funds, you can apply for forgiveness now, right? Correct. Now, this is the one thing is it, this is SBA is not administering the forgiveness process. The lenders are right. so just as during origination, some lenders had different processes. There are there are uniform applications. However, if you're a restaurant, you're probably going your, your lender is going to probably have you go to an online portal to enter the information and upload it. You will not probably be filling out a, a paper document, um, but they all have different systems. And again, they had to kind of create their own systems for forgiveness. So different lenders have one thing. I would expect that the vast majority of lenders now uh, have their forgiveness portals working and that um, they are going to ramp up activity in that regard, where you would then upload not only your forgiveness application, but also your supporting documentation. And we're going to talk about that on the next slide real quick. But um, I didn't know if there's another question, Aaron, in the meantime. So, yeah, and then there's one I think I can answer real quickly, but correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, someone's asking, what is the, the base period for their second draw of PPP loan? And for that, I believe that a restaurant could take either 2019s, because everyone knows <clears throat> for first draw PPP, it was 2.5 times your average monthly payroll. Correct. For second draw PPP under restaurants, and hotels, you could take 3.5 times your average monthly payroll to Correct. achieve your PPP loan amount. Uh, I believe restaurants could either take 2019 as your average monthly way as your average monthly payroll, or they could take 12 months before they apply for their second draw of PPP. Uh, Bill, is that is that broadly accurate? Correct, but again, with the second draw, you have to demonstrate that 25% revenue reduction at quarter to quarter, year over year. So it, it's a yes, and remember that the whole point of the second draw is it's limited to businesses that have demonstrated at least a 25% revenue reduction in a quarter to quarter comparison. So the first three months of 2019 versus the first three months of 2020. If you know your business went down, or, or the second, you know the, the second quarter, calendar quarter of the year, uh, when this happened in 2020, your revenue might have gone down a lot more uh, than you had in 2019. That could demonstrate that yes, we met the 25% reduction. Right. So um, I'm going to quickly jump to the the one thing you can do, and, and again, I, I, let's let's keep back to, to key themes here. One, the intent. Of this program is to forgive most of the loans to the time frame for forgiveness for both SBA and the lender is longer right and there still might be policy enhancements uh, that the uh, SBA may uh, release uh, particularly in the coming weeks I, I don't I'm not saying they will but they might 
Um, and then three is that your lender is your forgiveness agent. Just as they helped you get the loan, they're gonna help you get the loan forgiven. So let's jump ahead to the next slide. And I, I, you know, Aaron, maybe we should just pause here for a second. Did we go back to the example of the 10 month? Remember when you and I had the conversation last night? Um, let's just keep something very simple because this is the potential exposure. And this, this is the one thing you need to keep in mind in terms of your time frame. So say you had a, a you received a loan um, in uh, August 20, uh, August 8th was the last day, but let's say August 1st, uh, of 2020, you got a PPP loan for a certain amount. You then chose an eight-week covered period. And so then the loan, your covered period ended uh, essentially October 1st because you spent the money during August and September. Again, the calendars don't match up, but eight-week period, we're going to simplify for two months right now. You then have from October 1st all the way back to August 1 of this year to apply for forgiveness before you need to start making payments. So on August 1st of this year, in this example, you need to pay, start paying back the loan with interest. So it is in your best interest to get those loans to your lender to forgiven. And I gotta think most of them want, they don't wanna have to service these loans or do that. They want to um, get these loans forgiven. So I, I, that's something to keep in mind is that after you spend the money, you have 10 months to apply for forgiveness for both first and second draw loans. Aaron, I don't know if you have any comment on that. No, I, I I think that's pretty clear direction. I think a lot of people have, have wisely said, let me jump at this opportunity, especially when we have easy loan forgiveness for those PPP loans of $150,000 and less. So let me get this off my books and apply quicker. But if you have a more complicated PPP loan and you wanna, you wanna take the time to demonstrate all the different components in your application, that's great. The one thing that I, I that we hear a lot, and this is probably my number one question about loan forgiveness is, talk to me about the safe harbor number one for PPP loan forgiveness. I do not have, I as a restaurant don't have the same number of FTEs uh, on my restaurant as I did at the beginning of my covered period or in the beginning of 2020. How do I demonstrate that when my state has changed their capacity restrictions? They lifted all the restrictions. Um, one of the things that we're trying to help with folks is the Safe Harbor One specifically asks about CDC and OSHA guidance. CDC and OSHA guidance are still talking about six feet of spacing. They're still talking about a lot of things that are pretty common in restaurants. So I would say that the Safe Harbor still applies right now, but you should be able to have the the guidance, the six feet of operating guidance and all the other things that happen during your covered period to show that you're unable to rehire your entire workforce. Have the CDC six feet guidance, have the OSHA guidance uh, that can help you demonstrate that it's really hard to rehire all the same number of people to meet your FTE count. Bill, I don't know if you have any uh, any recommendations yeah. on that. So there, there, there's a set, and I'm going to get into this, you know what, either okay. we can do Safe Harbor now or we can do it. No, I, no, I, no. Why, why, don't we, why don't we keep going? Well, I know people want that. Trust me, I saw the questions. So I just want to quickly say, okay, again, the three key messages here are uh, most loans will be forgiven. Two, that have patients working with your bar, you know, SPA and the lender have time, a large, longer time frame to get these done. Um, larger loans are probably going to take longer. And then three, but if you are ready to go and all of that too, and again, you, here's what how you should be able to document your your payroll costs, which is obviously your bank account statements, your business banking account or equivalent, your third party payroll reports, uh, your tax forms. Usually it's uh, IRS form uh, tax uh, uh, 941 um, and then all of any sort of associated uh, documentation of, of, you know, group of, of, of health insurance premiums and so forth that are part of the payroll. Um, thing and, and generally too if you work with a third party equivalent or have an accountant this should be relatively straightforward they should be experienced in pulling this information um, if you don't um, hopefully too uh, your loan is smaller and then again for your non-payroll costs and I want to jump back but again you really should have copies of your receipts for utility payments for supplier costs for if you had damage you know the the, the 
the cost to repair your restaurant if something unfortunate happened uh, because of a public disturbance um, or covered worker protections or something like that, some way to document, and these can be construction cost receipts, invoices from companies or, or what have you, or having to buy uh, medical equipment for your staff or so forth, you should have those receipts. That will make the process go much easier because what, as a, le as a lender, and I, spoke to, I speak to a lot of lenders, it's so much easier if you come, if your borrower comes with the information as opposed to you having going back and forth, that's only going to delay forgiveness more. Now, the one thing I do want to note, and we're going to talk about safe harbors is, is that there has been a streamlined, again, as part of this process to make it easier, for loans 50000 and below, there is an assumption, or, or you're, you're, you're automatically granted a safe harbor on either salary or full-time um, equivalent uh, reductions, meaning if you had a loan, a PPP loan less than fifty thousand, um, the government assumes that you know for the most part that uh, you 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 meet one of the safe harbors or those are not applicable to you. If you have a larger than that, again up to one hundred and fifty, you can certify that you met the requirements of the program and provide a little bit more documentation. There are actually four different types of, of forgiveness applications, so just keep that in mind. Your lender will know the right one uh, based on your circumstances and the loan amount. It's uh, most times the, the size of the loan determines which application you're going to use. Um, but again, the process has, and Aaron knows this, it started out with a 13-page forgiveness application. And for the 50000 and below, it's, it's essentially down to one with some other pages we have to put in or the government had to put in for OMB reporting purposes. Um, but you're really only filling out one for 50000 and below. And the other two I would encourage you, if you had not done it on your origination, is to put, um, you know, it's very optional to put demographic information, but I think this program has been a tremendous success. And if you want to put your demographic information in there and you're okay with doing that, it's voluntary, I would encourage you to do so. Um, safe harbor exemptions. Essentially what this means is, is that you were not able to keep your employees, so let's, let's use a very simple example of 10 uh, employees, but um, or you were not able to keep them at a, a at least twenty at least seventy five percent of their original wages, and obviously, this there's a lot of exemptions. Uh, and I, I forgot this slide, but I wanted to keep it straightforward. Um, there are safe harbors that say, okay, you can still get forgiveness if certain circumstances have it. One, the CDC guidelines, which I think is very applicable to the restaurant industry. Um, I think that uh, Aaron, you would know best, but there are certainly still states. Um, that aren't full capacity yet, um, or certain major metropolitan areas in particular where the restaurant industry is, is big. Mm -hmm. um, or two, that you were, un say the employee resigned, so one of your employees left, you tried to rehire them, and they did not come back, and you were not able, and so you had to document that. So let's say you went from 10 employees to nine, and therefore um, you did have a reduction in your FTE count, but you offered them and they did not return, and you also reported to the state unemployment uh, so that they are not then essentially double dipping on benefits, the employee, not you. Um, that is a safe harbor, as well as um, if you are unable because of the, the business operations and activity to maintain normal business operations. I think this is the safe harbor that is clearly relevant to the restaurant industry. I mean, Congress recognized the, the tremendous impact that the restaurant industry was facing by uh, changing the loan calculation amount to 3.5 times um, the, the uh, monthly payment or average monthly uh, payroll expense because of the tremendous burden that had been placed on restaurants. Aaron, I, I don't know if you have any uh, comments. Sorry, I was just uh, answering a question yeah. uh, on a couple of things that, that I think we're familiar with, uh, but I one of the questions was that I that I had circled here was is the can we well can we use PPE expenses up for PPP second draw forgiveness? The answer there is yes. Uh, PPE costs or protective personal protective equipment, uh, plex, plexiglass barriers, uh, other things that allow your restaurant to be outside and to uh, to be clean and safe. Those are acceptable PPP second draw forgivable expenses. Again, these are detailed on your 
uh, loan forgiveness application. Uh, another good question that I, I almost forget about because now I'm, I'm getting back my uh, April and May 2020 um, memory, but someone asked the question about the, when you're looking at the 60-40 split of payroll versus non-payroll, mm -hmm. can a restaurant claim forgiveness if they made it all on payroll costs? The answer is that 60% is the minimum that needs to go to payroll costs, which include not only paychecks, but group health benefits, uh, other group benefits that you might offer. Um, so payroll is a minimum of 60%. A lot of our restaurants, a lot of, they just said, I put 100% to payroll to make it clean and simple, especially with the 24 week period where I could spend it. Um, so it was just literally a payroll loan. And that's probably the easiest way to get it all forgiven. But we also wanna make sure that restaurants have the flexibility to use it on rent, uh, utilities, and other things during the covered period. Correct. Right. Yeah, yeah and, and I, I mean, I haven't looked at the data in a few months, obviously, but the vast majority of the forgiveness data showed that I think almost 90% of the loans funds were being used almost only exclusively for payroll. So that's very common. And that was the intent of the program was to really cover payroll. But as Aaron said, that Congress and the administrations have updated it to make to provide some flexibility because not every restaurant has just uh, payroll expenses. They also had these worker protection expenses, which are truly forgivable, uh, you know, a covered non-payroll expense because of the Economic Aid Act and so forth. Right. Um, Aaron, I, I think right now we have about 10 minutes or a little less, uh, maybe do some questions uh, and, you know, we can, we can kind of go there. I think one of the things that I saw in the questions was timing. So again, I, I would urge you to have patience. Oh, I, I, let me talk about loan reviews one real quick too. So again, I mentioned this earlier, but um, there is a process for loan review is its own process in addition to forgiveness. They are related, but they are not the same process. So in SBA's mind, they are, when they are looking at a loan and they're reviewing the documentation, the, uh, if it's eligible, um, I don't think this is in most instances applicable to restaurants. Restaurants are, you know, for the most part, uh, unless they are a 501c7 or a nonprofit, um, uh, restaurants are, are pretty straightforward, small business entities. Um, there might be some size considerations there, but they have a loan review process, which they are allowed to then review. If your loan comes up for a loan review, it does not mean you are not getting forgiveness. It means that SBA is reviewing this, that there could be some of their, you know, their systems check um, that something came up. Uh, they will communicate with the lender and the lender will communicate with you. It does not mean you are not getting forgiven. It might just mean more documentation and more explanation. One of the things too is that there are plenty of rules and Aaron knows this with this program. And part of what I tried to do when I was at SBA and what I'm trying to do now in the private sector when I talk about this program is reassure people. Um, last year was tremendously difficult for most Americans and particularly for small business owners. And the, the senior officials in federal government in, in, in Congress and in the executive branch recognize that and are trying to double, double impact or double victimize uh, small business borrowers. So the intent is to forgive most of these loans with appropriate guardrails and maintaining pro program integrity. The intent is that it may take some time because forgiveness should take a little bit longer because that's when the taxpayer's uh, exposure is, is greatest at risk. Again, if you have received the loan that has come from your lender, you should thank them. Uh, they will get reimbursed, but that's their money up front they put there. Um, the third thing through is the best thing you can do to have your forgiveness process go smoothly is to gather your documentation and receipts that show how you spent the money appropriately in the covered period. Um, your lender will be a source of guidance here. Um, again, they will have streamlined processes and so forth. But this is something you can do to get ahead of the curve and try to simplify it as much as you can. Lenders are just like everybody else. They like it, you know, just give it to me once and give it to me straight and they, they can do that. The thing with loan reviews and other things too is, is the narrative is important and telling your story of not just of the facts of, you know, the, the facts and figures of you were the data, but also what you were experiencing could be part of any important loan review process. And so I think that um, do not assume that your narrative and how um, decisions were made or so forth in this time aren't relevant to the situation and outcomes. 
And so I just remind that, um, you know, I'm not trying to give you legal or financial advice, but I can say that there is an allowance, um, you know, for narratives in your process as part of the loan forgiveness as well and things to consider. And so um, for organizations like the NRA can obviously uh, help you in that regard as uh, hired professionals. And if you can, I, I would encourage you to work with your restaurant association who may be able to provide some resources as part of that. So Aaron, we can now take some questions if it's uh, good with you. Yeah, well, I'm gonna do some speed dating with you <clears throat> and I'm gonna offer something up or, or let's call it tennis. I'm gonna offer something up and you're gonna tell me whether or not you're gonna return it or, uh, or let it go as a bad serve. Uh, our payroll processing fees, payroll processing fees, ADP, uh, number of vendors out there, are they considered cost of payroll? I'm gonna say no. Yes, they are. They are part of payroll. It clearly says cover it. I'm reading it right here from the IFR that was released in January because a covered operations expense is a payment for any business or software cloud computing services that facilitates business operations, um, the processing payment or tracking payroll expenses, human resources, sales and billing, or accounting or tracking. So it's for the, if you have an online service like ADP, that could be, you know, or QuickBooks Online or something like that. This cost of that service is a covered expense. That's great. All right. You heard it here from the expert, certainly not me, but your payroll processing fees are forgivable payroll expenses. <clears throat> Next question. Software, the software. <laughs> software. The software is. Right. Yes. Not the, not the payment to ADP for processing the payroll, but the, the cost of the software is. Correct. Okay. Um, our payroll, our, our second draw PPP period ends mid June. Rent is due on July 1. Do I need to prorate it if I'm paying rent for the month of June or do I use the entire month of June as, as eligible for rent if my PPP second draw period ends June 15th? So you pay your June rent on June 1, uh, and, but your, your covered oh. period ends June 15th. So she, she's saying that she pays the, the rent for June 2021 right. is due on July 1st, almost like a retroactive payment. Well, yeah. It, so, yes, it's, it, it, it clearly says that, um, you know, pay, not this would be a non-payroll cost and it's incurred or paying during the covered period or before uh, um, it's incurred during the covered period but paid before the next payroll date. Mm -hmm. That's the key thing is the relation to the payroll date. Mm -hmm. So if it's incurred during the covered period, alternative payroll covered period, but paid or before the next regular payroll date. So it depends, it might be a pro rata situation. Yeah, you would wanna, I, I, would, I would recommend that you talk to your lender about it because you're gonna have to explain it to your lender on the, on the other end anyway and say, hey, this is my, this is my thought. Should I just prorate it and do two weeks of it uh, and just make sure that they're going to give you a thumbs up on forgiveness? Because that's what we're aiming for here. Yeah. And uh, just on that, from, the lender makes the determination for SBA. The lender says to SBA, this is what I think should be done. So the loan should be forgiven in full or not or whatever. Then SBA goes, OK, we're going to look at this ourselves. But the lender is really a lot of that is made by the lender itself. And so um, that is important, what you said to kind of, you're selling it to your lender. Right. They're, they're really important in this forgiveness process. And that's what the lender and the SBA have 60 days to make a determination on your loan forgiveness status. So that's what they- No, the lender has 60 days, then SBA has 90, 150 days at least. So the lender has 60 days to make this determination. So let's make it easy on them let's clear it ahead of time before you include it in your payroll expenses or in non-payroll expenses for your PPP loan. Um, make sure you clear it with your lender, lender before you make any big decisions there. Um, can you clarify whether or not there are different expenses to be used and forgivable under PPP first draw versus PPP second draw? So this is something we've done a lot of work on. I urge everyone who has questions about the second draw PPP to go to restaurants act.com backslash rr no i'm sorry just restaurantsact.com go to federal resources and there's a big ppp second draw fact sheet where you can look at all the different eligible expenses for ppp second draw 
see how it's different from PPP first draw. And you can do, you can do that. You can have them laid out right in front of you. Um, but I did kind of, I, I mentioned the intersection of ERTC and RRF. <clears throat> so the big thing with ERTC is that you can't apply for an employee retention tax credit from the IRS on payroll that you're paying with PPP. So just be very aware of that is you can't, while you can take ERTC and PPP during the year, don't intersect them for payroll specifically. Um, and when it comes to when it comes to RRF, there's actually not a lot of intersection concerns that I would share with you. And that's because SBA is deducting PPP first draw and second draw from your eligible RRF grant amount. So there's not as much of um, intersections con concerns because they're actually being deducted. Just make sure you don't intersect ERTC, which are tax credits for payroll for employee retention. Don't intersect ERTC with your second draw PPP expenses on payroll. And, and, and this is the same thing too. Uh, you don't, the reason we're doing, the government is doing this is you don't want the double tax. You're not getting two benefits. Either you're getting PPP or the ERTC. Um, or you're getting the restaurant grant or the PPPs. So that's the idea behind that, real quick. Um, real quick, you can follow me on Twitter at Bill Briggs or shoot me an email. Um, you know, I'm, I, 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 I love going to restaurants right now. Actually, it's one of my favorite things to do is walk into a restaurant and go, did you get a PPP loan? And, uh, you know, just see and hear their story, both good and bad, quite frankly. Um, but it's always, they, m most of the time, they just said it was a lifesaver and that means a lot. Because when I was there, I didn't hear good news. I only heard bad news. So it's good to see that some of the program really worked and benefited. Yeah, and, and Bill's not only a, a good follow for information, he also, every now and then he does a, um, almost like a mini documentary on what we were saying last year. And going through his April, 2020 recaps brought me a little bit of uh, post-traumatic stress right. in terms <laughs> of uh, what it was like to work 80 hours a week. Again, as I told a lot of you who are on this webinar, it was, it was just work for me. It wasn't livelihoods and employees and communities like you were dealing with. So we were happy to do it. Um, but he's an interesting follow and it's a really important perspective, I think. Uh, one of our last questions, and it's an important one, do food costs qualify as supply costs? Again, this is in our document at restaurantsact.com. But uh, Bill, do we have we know that supplier costs are covered under PPP second draw. Does that include food and beverage? Yeah, because it's perishable perishable goods, yes. Um, that, I think, again, that was the intent during the covered period. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It's not just, it's, it's again, that covered period, SBA is essentially putting blinders on and saying, okay, what did you spend your money on at that point? And was it eligible for forgiveness? Right. Yeah, and it's confusing a little bit because uh, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund grant program, it lets you reach back into the previous year. This isn't a reach back. Know your covered period, study your covered period, limit your expenses to your covered period, make it easy on the lender to give you a green light on loan forgiveness. Uh, but keep working with us. Uh, we we, we want to wrap up now. It's about three o'clock. Uh, I want to remind everyone we have a recording that we're going to be sharing with people uh, as soon as this week. Uh, but most of all, thank you so much to Bill Briggs for his insight, uh, everything he's done over the last 14 months, uh, the, so his ongoing support for restaurants and hospitality. Uh, he is a true expert when it comes to this field, and we were very fortunate to have him uh, at the helm of this program uh, on behalf of the SBA last year and, and into this year. Um, so, Bill, thank you so much for today. And I'll, I'll give you uh, the last words. Listen, I, I, I started my own consulting business this year. Um, I'm in awe of what you guys do. It is so important um, that restaurants are a part of communities. It's a place where people come together, especially after the last year when we weren't able to be together. Um, so you guys are doing, keep at it. I, I just, I wish I could do more. Um, and I, I want to be helpful as much as possible, but my, my hat's off to you and, and thank you for giving me the chance um, to speak today. Um, I wish you well, and I hope some, at some point I can come to all of your restaurants um, and, and meet you at some point. But again, thank you for everything you have done and please keep at it. It's very important. All right. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you for everyone for being on again. As I said, 
Uh, we will have the recording available. We will have the slide deck available. Uh, there are resources on second draw PPP and loan forgiveness aspects on restaurantsact.com. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.